Hello YouTube, Sidekick here with another episode of 70 Years of Moving Mud, a History of Iron Bombing podcast. This is episode 11, By the Numbers. In this episode, we're going to talk about United States Navy fighter development between the Korean and Vietnam War. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit about development prior to Korea as well, because we'll need it for context. I was originally expecting to do uh, one episode on all the Navy aircraft of this era, but, uh, you know, kind of like I did for the Air Force in the last episode, but as per usual with the Navy, things got complicated, and so I'm going to split this discussion into two parts. Today we're going to talk about uh, fighter aircraft, next time we'll talk about attack aircraft. Um, this is actually necessary, because unlike the Air Force, uh, at the time, uh, the Navy actually acknowledged that it needed both types of aircraft. Before we get started, one thing I just want to apologize if the quality of the slideshow is a little bit lower this time. A lot of these aircraft are a little bit obscure. There aren't that many pictures of them available, at least not from public sources. So I apologize if uh, some of the uh, images are a bit repetitive and also if they're a bit uh, lower resolution than usual. But anyways, um, let's just back up a bit uh, quickly uh, before we start talking about the aircraft. Um, this is kind of stuff I've been going over for the last few episodes. So really, if you want the whole story on what we're going to be talking about today, uh, you should go back and listen to at least maybe the last three episodes of the podcast if you haven't uh, done that already. But I'll give the short version of what we've been talking about. Um, starting in the early 1950s, aircraft technology underwent kind of a tectonic shift as scientists and engineers learned how to design and build aircraft that could break the sound barrier. The need for this kind of performance was demonstrated clearly in the Korean War when the two fighters that could flirt with the sound barrier, the F-86 and the MiG-15, pretty clearly outclassed any other aircraft, including, by the way, the fighters that the United States Navy was using at the time. After the Korean War, uh, because of the way the war had played out, uh, the Eisenhower administration and the United States adopted a doctrine known as massive retaliation, um, this doctrine basically said that if the United States or any of its allies were threatened by any kind of military provocation from the communist bloc, uh, the United States was prepared to respond with a devastating and disabling nuclear first strike. In effect, uh, the U.S. sought to deter any armed confrontation with either the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China by threatening to start and win a nuclear war. Now, this had a dramatic effect on the way aircraft were designed after Korea. Uh, the Air Force, in particular, focused on strategic bombers to deliver the nuclear weapons uh, on, and on high-speed, high-altitude interceptors to shoot down the enemy, enemy bombers that were trying to do the same. At a tactical level, the Air Force uh, focused on essentially strike fighters, that were going to be able to deliver nuclear weapons in order to pave the way for the strategic bombers by taking out key air defense nodes. Okay, so that's pretty much what we've talked about in the last few episodes. Um, now, the Korean War and its aftermath, though, left the Navy in a bit of a quandary, unlike the Air Force. I mean, on one hand, they knew they needed to replace much of their aircraft stable with more modern designs um, because they were finding that they were pretty stale by the end of the war. But they weren't really sure what those aircraft were supposed to accomplish in the context of both their experience in Korea and the new overall doctrine of massive retaliation. Now, on the upside, the Korean War, at least the start of the Korean War, had been a major validation of the basic Navy philosophy that it was the most effective service for projecting U.S. power around the globe and that its ability to do that was centered on the aircraft carrier task group. On the downside, the carriers and the carrier aircraft with which the Navy had saved the day in the summer of 1950 were looking pretty dated by 1953, given the advances in aircraft technology, in ground-based defenses, and uh, the state of the geopolitical situation. So, in fact, the Navy was kind of searching for the right solution or combination of solutions. Um, and that's kind of obvious when you look at the sheer number of designs that made it into service, with the Navy, um, and you compare that to the Air Force. Uh, as we saw in the last episode, in terms of fighters or fighter-bomber aircraft, the Air Force had exactly five designs that made it into service between 1950 and 1960, 
And we could probably, if we wanted to, also uh, include the F-4, which uh, was briefly known as the F-110 Spectre by the Air Force, which did actually fly before 1960, but really was a different generation of aircraft. So let's say the Air Force developed five new designs to join, say, the F-86 and the F-84 that were already in service. In the same time period, the Navy experimented with something like nine different fighter designs and a further five uh, attack aircraft designs. Now, part of the reason that this is a little hard to figure out, and it it took me a while, um, is because um, of the U.S. military numbering system, which, despite being an extremely nerdy topic, is one that is worth a bit or even a substantial digression. And that is frankly because, folks, I've spent... The time to actually figure this out, including having to resort to, yes, making spreadsheets. So there is no way I'm going to pass up the opportunity to get some value out of that time by putting it into the podcast. So buckle up and pay attention, kiddies. This material will be on the final exam. Uh, The whole issue comes about because the Navy and the Air Force had completely different ways of numbering aircraft. Until 1962, that is. And this is because when aircraft, you know, first became a thing, the Navy and the U.S. Army Air Force, the forerunner of the United States Air Force, were actually two different departments of the U.S. government, the Department of the Army and the Department of the Navy. And they weren't really on speaking terms. Now, World War II changed that, at least sort of. Um, The prosecution of the war convinced the civilian leadership that all of the U.S. military forces should report to a single department. And that became the Department of Defense in 1947, which at the same time, which is at the same time that the Air Force was created as a separate service. But just because they were all part of the same family now did not mean that the Navy and the Air Force spent any more time talking to one another. But it did mean that they all reported to one member of the cabinet, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, For the first 15 years or so of this arrangement, the services were pretty much untroubled by this arrangement. Um, arguably because the various secretaries of defense were either widely respected by all concerned, like George Marshall and James Forrestal, or more or less completely ineffective, like Lewis Johnson. And then came Robert McNamara, who was neither. John F. Kennedy's secretary of defense was definitely a man who had an impact wherever he went. He was also one of those personalities who inspired either great admiration or utter contempt. Now, whole books have been written about Bob McNamara, so I'm not going to say much more than that. One thing is certain, McNamara knew a thing or two about inefficiency and redundancy, and it drove him nuts. One of his most pet peeves was the overlap between the Navy and the Air Force's efforts to develop new aircraft. One of the things he insisted on when he got into office was that the Navy and the Air Force collaborate on their next-generation fighter design. This would eventually become the F-4, To say the amalgamation was resisted by both services would be the understatement of this decade and that one. Even after the program had been consolidated, the Navy and the Air Force continued to use their own numbers for the same aircraft. So McNamara would go to one briefing and hear all about the F-4H, and then he'd go to another completely different briefing and hear about the F-110, which would have been fine, except that they were actually the same aircraft. Um, The two different services just couldn't agree to what to call it. This enraged McNara to the point where he finally insisted that the two, well, actually three if you included the Army, services come up with a standard nomenclature for aircraft, which they finally did in 1962, which is a very long-winded way of introduction about why the designations of Navy aircraft suddenly changed right before the Vietnam War. It also explains some other anomalies of U.S. aircraft naming, like how the F-110 became the F-4, and how the next U.S. Four fighters after the F-4 were actually numbered 14, 15, and 16. All of this will be made clear if you stick with me, I promise. So, to back up the truck to the early days of military aviation, when the Navy and the Army started acquiring aircraft, they needed to figure out how to number them. They both decided that the various aircraft should be labeled first with a letter that described the aircraft's function. So, A for attack, B for bomber, C for cargo... F for fighter in the Navy's case, although the Army opted for P for pursuit. Nonetheless, both services agreed on that part of the nomenclature. And just about nothing else. The Army went uh, with a fairly simple system, whereby each new design was simply given the next available number. So the P-39 followed the P-38, which was followed by the P-40. 
the fact that there appears to be quite a number of gaps, and the numbering is mostly due to the fact that even experimental and prototype designs that never made it into widespread service did get their own numbers. Now, if there were subvariants of a particular model, they were identified with a letter. So, for instance, the P51D is a later model of the P51 than the P51B. The Navy, on the other hand, went for a completely different system. As I said, the Navy started with the aircraft classification letter, but this was then followed by another letter designating the manufacturer of the aircraft. Now, if a manufacturer produced more than one design for the Navy, a number was placed between the classification letter and the manufacturer's letter. So, the first fighter that Curtis produced for the Navy was the FC, and the second one was the F2C, and so on. So, now you can see the problem uh, could arise when the Navy and the Air Force were in the same room talking about aircraft. Each of them had a nomenclature consisting of a letter followed by a number and then another letter. They sounded the same, but they were completely different. For instance, at one time, in about 1960, you could have encountered references to the F4U, the F4F, the F4B, the F4C, the F4D, the F4H, and not to mention the FJ-4. These were all completely different aircraft. In fact, some of them were biplanes and some of them were modern jets. Uh, at the same time, if you were talking to the Air Force, you would have heard references to the F-4B and the F-4C, which were actually different variants of the same aircraft. And by the way, they were also the same aircraft as the aforementioned F-4H to the Navy. So, um, can you blame Secretary McNamara for losing a bit of his um, uh, semi-digested vegetable matter over this whole question? The whole situation um, actually kind of reminds me of the old quote about uh, Britain and America being two cultures separated by a common language. At any rate, having been sent away to get their um, stuff together, the services came back with a system that was basically the same as the one the Air Force used, except they agreed, at least for fighters, to reset the number to one. So the existing United States Air Force fighters, except the F-110, would keep their numbers. All Navy designs would acquire a new number, and new designs would start at the end of that list. And so you end up with this. Yes, I do have a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet shows how the numbers were assigned. So you can see that the F-1 was actually assigned to the Navy FJ, which, by the way, is the navalized version of the F-86. But, you know, let's not go there. After the numbers were assigned, um, such that they kind of lined up with the Navy designations, except where that wasn't possible. So... The F2D became the F2, the F3D became the F3, the F9F became the F9, etc. And that's how you end up actually having the F4 become, well, the F4. Now, to complete the story, um, you need to know that the F12, which comes after this list ends, was actually a code name given to the F117 while it was in development. Um, 13 is a number that they, is typically not assigned for triskaidekaphobia reasons. So the F4 in sequence is followed by the F14, and then the 15, and then the 16. Simple? See? Let's not talk about how we go from that to 22 and 35, okay? That's a topic for another day. Now, the list is similar, but actually a lot less complicated on the attack side. And here's the table for that, for those aircraft. As you can see, the AD Sky Raider became the A1. You'll recognize the A4 and the A6 as pre-Vietnam War designs. Now, I actually uh, extended this list a little farther. I included numbers up to 10 because I did want to make a point, and that's the point that the first eight numbers on the list, the first eight attack aircraft in the sequence, are actually Navy aircraft. The ninth is a prototype, and you get have to get to 10 before you get an Air Force plane that makes an appearance on the list. And it's the last one to do so. Okay, to be fair, the A-1 and the A-7 both served in Air Force livery, but they were never the Air Force's idea. So it says something about the fundamental orientation of the Navy and the Air Force and their doctrine that the Navy had attack aircraft and the Air Force basically didn't. And that's something we're going to come back to a bit later when we talk about Vietnam and its aftermath. Okay, with that in hand, we can talk about the Navy's aircraft in the 1950s. As I said, after the Korean War, there was a fair bit of hand-wringing going on in Navy circles. Uh, first of all, the conflict had convinced them that a balanced carrier air wing was essential to preserving their power projection role. 
To this end, they wanted to continue having a balance of fighter and strike aircraft. Um, the experience had shown them, though, that they really did genuinely need a specialized strike aircraft. The thing was, at the end of the World War II, the carrier wings had been moving more towards embarking more fighters that could be used as multi-role aircraft, basically as fighters or bombers had, as needed. In fact, in Korea, the fast attack aircraft of choice was actually the F4U Corsair of World War II vintage. But uh, when it was demonstrated to be increasingly obsolete and the Navy tried to replace its strike functions, mostly flak suppression, but some actual striking of targets, with the F-9F as a fighter bomber, they really weren't all that happy with the results. On the other hand, the AD Sky Raider proved again and again that a dedicated strike platform was essential. But as much as the Navy and the Marines loved the Sky Raider, they knew that they needed an upgraded model that could fly higher and faster and carry at least as much, if not more, into the fight. The Navy also knew that it had to replace its fighters. Their first-generation straight-winged subsonic jets just couldn't compete with the likes of the F-86 and the MiG-15. Now, there was an elephant in the room, though, and the pro that was the problem of operating a supersonic jet from an aircraft carrier. And this was a significant issue. For one thing, the slow speed handling qualities of the early supersonic jets were notoriously nasty. They stalled at high speed. Their stall characteristics were also nasty. They tended to require very high uh, angles of attack at slow speed, and that made visibility over the nose a problem. And if that wasn't enough of a problem, at the other end of the flight deck, there was also an issue in that they were much heavier. They had more power, but their jet engines tended to develop that power much more slowly. So they needed to get up to speed before their engines were really kicking in, all of which meant that they needed catapults for launch, but much heavier duty catapults that had been needed before. So that was one topic that was going to require some serious experimentation, as we'll see. There were other issues, though, and these were the ones coming from the geopolitical situation in one form or another. The first of these stemmed from their own side, with the advent of massive retaliation, the Navy felt very strongly that in order to be relevant, it was going to have to develop attack aircraft that were nuclear capable. Um, so there was going to be some significant experimentation around that idea. The second factor stemmed from the other side. Uh, in the 1950s, it was becoming clear that the Soviets were designing and developing long-range bombers that were literally capable of reaching out and touching the U.S. Navy, even in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and the Navy needed to protect itself against this threat. This meant that new aircraft were going to have to be focused on long-range high-altitude interception of slow-flying bombers rather than fighters that were focused on short-range escort and combat air patrol functions, which were the classic uh, dogfighting air superiority fighters that the Navy had used before. The final factor that was becoming important in the Navy's consideration was the desire to make use of improvements in technology, not merely in aerodynamics, but also in avionics, uh, specifically in radar or more broadly electronic warfare. The Navy really did uh, seem to be much more interested in these developments than the Air Force. I think partly because of the success that the Navy had had during Korea, the Navy had actually made fairly extensive use of radar-equipped night fighters that had proven, first of all, to be effective at engaging enemy fighters, but also, later in the war, had been pretty good at locating ground targets, uh, specifically truck convoys that moved at night. So the Navy began thinking about and looking for all-weather attack and fighter aircraft to complement its day designs. The idea being that these all-weather aircraft would not only be able to operate in inclement weather, but also at night, but more importantly, they'd be able to identify their targets both on the ground and the air and at much greater ranges. Although still in its infancy, we'll see how this focus on the electronic spectrum paid off in Vietnam and really did become the way of the future, particularly for the Navy. So with that for background, let's take a look at Navy aircraft in the interwar, meaning between Korea and Vietnam, years. And let's do it by manufacturer like we did with the Air Force. Um, so let's start uh, with some manufacturers we haven't heard from before. Um, let's start with Grumman. Now, Grumman had a long association with the Navy, going back to its original fighter offering in the 1930s, which was the FF. Famously, Grumman provided two of the mainstays of the U.S. carrier fighter force during World War II, the F-4F Wildcat and the F-6F Hellcat, of which more than 12,000 were produced. 
Grumman also produced the Navy's principal torpedo bomber, the TBF, as well as several flying boat designs that are less well-known, but which have become well-loved classics and which you can experience in that other flight simulator later where no mud is moved. Continuing on the CAT theme, Grumman had effectively become the Navy's fighter supplier of choice. They'd also produced the F-8F Bearcat, which had replaced the Hellcat at the very end of the war. Uh, it was the last prop-driven Navy fighter, though. By the time of Korea, it had been replaced on flight decks by the f 9 F, also a Grumman design. Now, the F-7F Tiger Cat twin-engine fighter survived a little longer than the F-8F, uh, seeing some service in Korea as a night fighter because it was large enough to accommodate early airborne radar equipment. Grumman was to lose its place as the Navy's fighter supplier to longtime rival thought, uh, and then to up-and-comer McDonnell Aerospace, but it would go on to continue to deliver iconic aircraft, including the A-6, and the C-2 and the E-2. And, as with so many aerospace contractors of the day, uh, Grumman would go on to be a significant contributor to the U.S. space program, eventually being the prime contractor for the Apollo's uh, program's lunar module. Grumman would eventually merge with Northrop in 1994 and around a consolidation that followed the end of the Cold War. So let's take a look at Grumman's aircraft in the 50s. Uh, the F-9F Panther, uh, together with the Air Force's P-80, later the F-80, uh, was the principal first generation um, of American fighters. Like the P-80, the F-9F was really a fairly standard Warbird design adapted to be powered by a jet engine in the rear instead of a piston engine in the front. It was a solid design that did yeoman service in Korea, but it was a straight-winged subsonic design, and by 1950, it really did belong to an earlier era. So after the Korean War, the call went out to find a replacement for the Panther that could compete with modern fighter designs. Grumman first responded with a swept-wing version of the F-9F, which they dubbed the Cougar, uh, but this was really a stopgap and didn't fully implement the modern design elements, uh, such uh, as transonic-compatible control services or an area-designed fuselage. Incorporating these changes morphed the F-9F into the F-11F Tiger, uh, not Tiger Cat. This began to arrive in the fleet in 1955, and it was still in service in 1962, when the great renaming occurred and it became the F-11. It really was Grumman's swan song as a fighter manufacturer, though. Although it brought the Navy into the modern age, it was always underpowered and short-legged, and it was kind of outclassed by Vought's F-8U, which we'll get to in a bit. Only 200 were produced, and by 1960, it had basically been withdrawn from frontline service. So another contractor that worked extensively for the Navy was Douglas Aircraft. Uh, Douglas was kind of the flip side of Grumman, where Grumman was basically a Navy fighter shop um, that had some other interests. Douglas was big in other areas, and they also worked for the Navy. Because most of Douglas's business was actually in large multi-engined aircraft, most famously, of course, the DC-3 or C-47, but also the DC-4 and the DC-5 before the war. The DC-4 uh, would also uh, see military service as the C-54, the company also designed the A-20 Havoc and the A-26 Invader. During the war, Douglas had formed a consortium with Boeing to produce the B-17 as well. By the end of the war, Douglas was the fifth largest U.S. defense contractor by contract value. For the Navy, the Douglas uh, had produced the TBD Devastator torpedo bomber in the late 1930s. Uh, the Devastator is principally remembered, of course, as being the obsolete lamb that was led to the slaughter at the hands of Japanese fighters at the Battle of Midway. Much more famous, for good reasons, was the SBD Dauntless, the, and I know I use this word a lot, iconic, and much beloved Navy dive bomber that more or less turned the tide of the Pacific War in that same Battle of Midway by sinking the entire Japanese fast carrier strike force in one day. They, of course, uh, followed up the SBD with the AD Sky Raider, which also went on to become, well, an icon. The ultimate expression of the prop-driven attack aircraft, which would actually be in service for almost 30 years. After the war, Douglas continued to build on its success as a large aircraft manufacturer, producing ever more evolved designs of their piston engine line with the DC-6 and DC-7, for the civilian market, and designs like the C-124 and C-133 for the military. But Douglas also invested heavily in transitioning to the jet age, which event would eventually culminate in the company becoming one of the main suppliers of jet airliners with the DC-8, DC-9, and DC-10. 
Let's face it, if there was a contest for companies that have produced the best remembered, or yes, most iconic aircraft designs, Douglas would really have to go to the front of the line. Uh, other companies built more aircraft, but there were few who built ones that are better remembered. Well, what was their secret? Well, in part, it was the team that Douglas assembled. Some of the truly most talented aerospace engineers of their era, including Ed Heinemann, who was the principal designer not only of the SPD and the AD, but also the A-20 and the A-26. And after the war, Heinemann turned his prodigious talent to bring the jet age to the U.S. Navy, which would, of course, culminate in the A-4 Skyhawk, a bit about which much more later. For now, let's talk about Douglas's fighter designs. Uh, let's start with the F-3D Sky Knight. Um, the sky theme is going to be prevalent here. Um, it was designed as an all-weather or night fighter with side-by-side uh, -side seating and room to accommodate radar. It first flew in 1948. It was straight-winged and subsonic. It saw some service in Korea as a night fighter, and, and it did have some success. Uh, it was flown by the Marines um, from land-based squadrons, and it actually had the most kills of any naval aircraft. And it was still in service by the time of Vietnam, and it became the F-10. It flew early in Vietnam, actually, as an electronic warfare platform known as the EF-10B. After that came the F-4D Skyray, uh, which was Douglas's last fighter design before it eventually merged with McDonnell. Uh, it was the first Navy aircraft to exceed Mach 1 in level flight, and it was a delta-wing design. It had real trouble with its power plant, like a lot of early jet aircraft, and it really was designed as an interceptor, or what would later be called a fleet defense fighter. Uh, in fact, the first squadron equipped um, was the Navy squadron assigned to NORAD. Um, it hung around long enough um, to become the F-6, but it really didn't spend a lot of time with the fleet. Uh, Douglas also designed the F-5D Sky Lancer, but it was felt to be pretty similar to the Crusader, and the Navy was kind of feeling that they were a little bit overly dependent on Douglas at this time because it was also producing the Sky Raider and the Skyhawk, and so the Sky Lancer really never went anywhere. Um, so next, let's take a look at a company we've talked about before and one which would eventually combine with Douglas, and that's McDonnell Aerospace. I'm not going to say much more here except to note that this is actually the first of the companies we're talking about to have had a significant uh, overlap with the Air Force, at least in fighter designs. Uh, also note that, of course, uh, as I said, McDonnell famously joined Douglas in the like, uh, late 1960s to form, his, form Mac, uh, McDonnell Douglas or MacDAC. As we've talked about the last time, McDonnell was kind of new to the game of designing aircraft in the 1950s, and they actually cut their teeth on Navy designs. Their first aircraft was the FH Phantom, uh, it was actually designed in pre-Korean uh, times. It was straight-winged and subsonic, and it didn't really uh, do very much, uh, but it was valuable experience. Uh, after that came the F-2H Banshee, which was really an upgrade of the FH. Uh, it later um, actually hung around until 1962, and it became the F-2. Now, it was a little bit different in that it was twin-engined with engines in the wing roots, and it not only was successful with the... Uh, the U.S. Navy, but also with the Royal Canadian Navy, serving on the HMCS Bonaventure. Uh, the next entry into the fray for uh, McDonnell was the F-3H Demon, which became the F-3 in 1962. It was a replacement for the Banshee. Um, now, this design featured a single engine, but with intakes in the wing roots. And you can start to see the similarities to, to the F-101 and the F-4, except, of course, they were twin engine. And that's probably because um, the F-3H was basically found to be pretty underpowered and outclassed by the Crusader, and it was really retired from active service with the fleet uh, before Vietnam. And that brings us to McDonnell's most famous aircraft, uh, at least of the era, the F-4H Phantom II, and uh, we will cover that later. So after McDonnell, let's take a look at Vought. Uh, Vought Aerospace was the other main supplier of fighters to the United States Navy after Grumman. Vought was known by many names, including Chance Vought, uh, which was in fact the name of the founder. In all of its incarnations, it was principally known to, for designing aircraft for the Navy, and it had a history of doing that going back to the 1920s. But of course, its most famous design was the F-4U Corsair, which served on the front lines of both the Second World War and Korea 
Um, after the F4U, um, the Vought tried the F6U Pirate, which was their first attempt at a jet fighter, and it was a pretty standard straight-wing subsonic design. And it was only bought in small numbers, and it didn't really see a lot of frontline service. After that came the much more innovative F7U Cutlass. Uh, it was an attempt to build a higher-performing jet design. It was a twin-tailed delta wing. It was strongly influenced, actually, by German design experience in World War II, because a number of those German designers ended up working at Vought. It was an innovative design, um, but it just kind of proved to be too dangerous for frontline service. Um, the problems were stemmed from a combination of being underpowered and just not being well suited to either supersonic or low speed flight because of the compromises in the design. So by the late 1950s, uh, Vaught was kind of being shut out. And as we have seen uh, with new participants like McDonnell, um, the field of companies trying to design the next big thing for the Navy was getting a bit crowded. Uh, but no one had really cracked the code of how to build a carrier-capable aircraft that was also capable of performing as a supersonic high-performance fighter. So Vought needed to try something a little bit different, which is frankly something they were good at. So they produced the F-8U Crusader. And the Crusader had a few innovations that helped it crack the code. Uh, now, the most obvious of these was the variable incidence wing, not to be confused with variable geometry wings like the F-111, F-14, and MiG-23 of the late 1960s. Uh, no, so instead, um, the leading edge of the wing of the F-8, and the wing was mounted at the top of the fuselage, and the leading edge could be raised up, changing its instantaneous angle of attack. Now, this looked kind of strange, but it meant that at slow speeds, when high angles of attack were needed, like on landing, the plane would not have to be flown so nose high, which greatly facilitated carrier landings. And it also made the ailerons and rudder more effective and avoided some of the worst effects of adverse yaw that a lot of designs had when they started to operate at high angles of attack. So the high wing design also meant that the landing main landing gear could be retracted into the fuselage, which meant that those landing gear legs were shorter and more compact, which also meant that it was easier to make them stronger strong enough to withstand the shock of repeated carrier landings. In the end, these innovations really did pay off. The F-8U was fast and maneuverable and could compete with the best land-based fighter designs. In fact, as a dogfighter, it was pretty much superior to anything the Air Force produced at the time, which is partly because the Air Force wasn't trying to produce dogfighters. And that is one thing to note. The F-8U was very much designed to be a classic air superiority fighter. Uh, in its original incarnation, its only armament was guns. It had no provision for carrying air-to-air -air missiles, although those would be added later. Now, on the one hand, this made the F-8 uh, very effective in Vietnam and made the point, still relevant today, that even in the age of missiles, a gun was essential. As one pilot said, bullets are a lot cheaper than missiles. There are a lot more of them, and they tend to go where you aim them. Um, this was particularly true in the early days of air-to-air -air missiles, which, having been designed to attack large, slowly moving and maneuvering bombers at high altitude, proved to be badly suited, to say the least, um, to fighting uh, against fast, agile fighters operating at low altitude. Now, of course, this would change as the uh, missile technology developed and became more adapted to actual uh, air combat maneuvering as opposed to interception of bombers. But nonetheless, the F-8U took the Navy from the late 1950s into the Vietnam era, and it was known after 1962, obviously, as the F-8. Okay, so there you have it. A bit of a sprint through the Navy's fighter designs uh, of the 1950s. As I said, it is a bit of a blizzard of letters and numbers. There is one thing that's important to note, though. Uh, all of the above aircraft, except for the F-4, have pretty much one thing in common. None of them ever spent any time really moving mud. As I said, after the Korean War, in contrast to the Air Force, the Navy really did divide the job of shooting down airplanes from the job of putting warheads on foreheads. It was a distinction that would continue, actually, until the mid-1980s. It was also a decision that would shape the aircraft that we're going to talk about in the next episode. When we turn our attention to some very serious movers of mud, the Navy's attack aircraft of the 1950s. So, join me next time when we'll talk about that. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you again soon.